I, I agree we can use liberalism against itself until a certain degree, but we do we do need some goals in common beyond the tactical aims, you know, totally. like beyond the beyond the tactical little steps, like little victories here and there. Uh, awesome Lula won in Brazil. We have Boric in Chile, you know, we have uh, Petro in Colombia. Like beyond those tactical victories, we have to go beyond and say, okay, good. So now Lula is still negotiating who owns the Amazon, but now he's negotiating with uh, with with some benefits to the Brazilian people. And it's like, dude, really? And at the moment here in the city, we have water cuts every day. So I only have water in my house from four in the morning till 11 a.m. Wow. Then I don't have water in my house what? the rest of the day. Yeah, uh, right That's now, crazy. Um, it has been like that all summer. And it's probably gonna be like that until September when we get water again with the rains, okay? And I'm talking about the third biggest city in Mexico. We have other 6 million people living here. And it's a very wealthy city. Actually, the 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 little uh, the one of the little spaces in the city is one of the wealthiest uh, neighborhoods in all of Latin America. So it's not a shitty backyard type of, no, it is a super well-developed cities with Lamborghinis and Ferraris on the street. And we have water from 4 a.m. till 11 a.m. in the morning, every morning. But at the same time, it's in this city where we have Heineken and Coca-Cola. And they consume millions of liters of water and they're constantly asking us for take faster showers. Hello, listeners. I come to you with a heavy heart. Um, and the listeners, of course, are both the, the humans listening to this and the scripts that are crawling our audio. On, on the pill pod, we've had a few mistakes along the way. <laughs> you are, you're going to share your shame with the listeners? Very rarely are those mistakes mine. But I would like to publicly apologize to our guest, who's, who I will introduce you to in a second. Because never in the history of the pill pod has there been a mistake this big, which is we got half we got half an hour into talking about stuff and it was fire, but you'll never hear it. It is lost to the sands of time and to the abyss that is the pure past. But we're gonna record it again. So thank you for our to our guest for uh, sticking around. So this is an episode with uh, Victor and I a co-host combination that we've uh, never had before, as far as I'm aware. No, I don't think so. So for the nice. last month or so, although not sequentially, we have been looking and re-looking at the idea of communism and all that is implied by both the words idea and the word communism. So just to catch you up on that, the idea of communism was a series of three conferences uh, which were subsequently put into books addressing that age-old question, what do we do now? Uh, particularly in light of the financial crisis, and that would be not the current, but the last financial crisis. <laughs> and so they dragged all of these celebrity Marxists out of their uh, dingy offices and put, put, put the task to all of them to decide what the academic response was to as to whether communism is really good for anything anymore. So that's what we are addressing again today. But at the moment, if you want to detect the, the echoes or reverberations uh, reaching us from some non-capitalist future, it doesn't look like any Anglo country or, or even any, any you know, quote-unquote Western country is headed in that direction. So as we, and I'll, probably a lot of our audience, and almost all of our source material on this podcast, whether it comes to uh, political theory or, or what to do next, is somewhat stuck in a little bit of an Anglo-Eurocentric box. And because we can't trust any English language news coming out of Latin America for some obvious reasons, we have invited Diego Ruzara, who we now have both talked to for half an hour, but uh, Diego, I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering for the listeners who may not know you, you're probably the most famous leftist that uh, I've never heard of until we started uh, talking on, on Instagram. But what the hell would you put on your business card? <laughs> yeah, like at uh, parties. Well, 
what do people comrades, what do you say comrades to people? don't have business cards but um <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell I would put on my business card. Something like the CEO motherfucker, something like Zuckerberg. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, th first of all, thank you guys so much for the invitation. I was I was telling you guys just before we started the second recording, first as far as now as tragedy that uh that, that is this episode of the Peel Pot, that I'm that I'm having a huge cringe fan out because I've heard pretty much every episode from the Peel Pot. I'm a huge fan. Since I started stalking you and you responded to me on Instagram and on Twitter, I said, guys. This project is way too cool for people not to be listening to this. I, I really want to be part. I want to participate, help as much as possible. So first of all, I'm really thankful for the invitation. And I, I really respect the work that you guys are doing. Uh, even, if, even if ideas don't matter, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a cool effort regardless. It's a aesthetically pleasing effort of nothingness, if you can say something like that. Mm. <laughs> uh, having said that, what, what's on my business card of what, how will I introduce myself? It's kind of weird because, um, I'm a content creator. I do a lot of YouTube. I, well, at least I've done a lot of YouTube for the past two years, but I'm active in every social media. I have a little team of, of people that, uh, that have been like following me since the beginning and they wanted to collaborate. So I make them like partners uh, in, under a, like a cooperative organization. So we, we, we create together. They help me edit the clips and edit the videos. And then we, we split the profits as, as much as, as we find uh, fit and just to the amount of work and, and talent that is required for the for the end result. And um, I'm currently working on a documentary regarding the politics and economics behind soccer around the world, especially for uh, marginalized uh, groups and how they use soccer to send a message under this idea. And especially since the World Cup is coming in November, it's going to be in Qatar, highly controversial because of many political and socioeconomical uh, implications. So I, I'm at the moment, I'm passionate about that project. And uh, for our listeners, you got to respect, he, he comes in here and he modulates for you by calling it soccer. When no one in the world calls it soccer. And Diego, the one other thing that I want to get out of the way is you told us you're not a leftist, whereas like the only thing that I would be able to just identify you as is a leftist. So what are we talking about there? I don't identify as a leftist, definitely, because I don't I don't find any leftist political projects that I can relate to, because I, I think and, and this is where, or where I think we can transition into the article um, in Latin America. What we have is especially Nefario's brand of leftist populism that seems to disguise itself under leftist notions, but don't really challenge any of the key underlying uh, real effects of, 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 of current life. So that's why I don't necessarily identify as a leftist. So if you're an Anglophone and you search up uh, Diego's name on, on Google, you'll find the debates, a debate. the yeah. lectures, the interviews. Now he's a documentary filmmaker. It's about... What would, you, what would you say? 80% Spanish, 20% English? Around something like that. Yeah, I've, I've been growing a lot in the U.S. lately, a lot with Latin communities in the U.S., which oh, I found nice. is, a, is a huge, huge market. But I will say, yes, the split is around 80-20. I guess I'm curious about like, so how did you start? What's kind of been your trajectory to become as we in our first version of the recording? So uh, your favorite title, Become This Political Influencer. You know, what was what was the journey from... <laughs> from kind of like being just someone who's interested. And I think you, you, maybe you can tell me, tell us again about some of like your own um, personal connections to philosophy as well. And mm. then like how maybe that led into where you are now. Sure. So like um, I'm, I'm a designer by formation. I have a, a master's degree in experience design. I study uh, the oh, design. Oh, you didn't master. tell us that. I didn't. He did. Well, it, I do. Is, is it product design or or like no, uh, not only graphic? that? My my specialty is in food design. Oh, yeah. What does yeah, that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Like packaging? Mean? <laughs> no, 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 no. Much much more complicated than that. It was fucking amazing, to be honest with you. Like I, this is this is the first part of my life when I was a really like a big capitalist pig, to be honest with you. <laughs> like I was climbing the ladder. I work in a multinational company. I was forced to wear suits. I was giving uh, presentations about innovation and strategy in New York with CEOs and shareholders. Like the first part of my life, I was really into fast moving consumer goods, like the food industry, to be honest with you. And my specialty was understanding the relationship between humans and food. Where do we get the pleasure, the pleasure from eating? And um, the first part of my career, I travel around the world and I publish like 
20 books about street food, about what people eat on the street and why, trying to understand mm. from the beginning, you know, from a very designer point of view, what was the relationship between portability, ergonomics, uh, price point, uh, culture, history, uh, techniques of cooking, available uh, utensils, like, and how this transformed and shaped the relationship between humans and food. And that got the attention from big companies. I got hired from, from PepsiCo, to be honest with you guys. I worked with PepsiCo oh, for God. like seven years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. And then and then I discovered something nefarious. It, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the nefariousness was there from day one. You're married to a Lacanian psychoanalyst. Correct. What did she think about you running around, basically writing on the desire of food? Well, <laughs> to be honest, that's how we met. We met when I was doing exactly that. And I think that's what got her attention at some point because I was talking so much about desire and pleasure and everything. <laughs> and she was like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. He's so cute. You know, like this asshole, like he's trying to impress me using words that don't make sense out of the context of Lacan. So yeah, we, 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 we got off like really well at the beginning. Like I was, you know, like I, I had no idea what it really meant to talk about desire and pleasure. I was only talking about desire and pleasure from the capitalist logic about how to drive consumption. I had no idea. And, and, and now when I look back, I just saw your video on this idea of consumerism and how marketing traps your desire. And it's, I would love to get into this conversation with you and give you a bunch of real life examples of how your video applies to how this actually operates in the real world, because it's scary. It's, it's fascinating, but at the same time, super, super scary. So uh, because well, of my I, wife... I could, I could only make that because I also have a background in marketing, but it was uh, web see, marketing, not food. But food sounds no. a lot more interesting. It, it was, man. It really was. Because in a way, and now because I'm reading uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty and also Hustler, like the, phenomenology is one of my favorite <laughs> fields. But I, I just look back at my career and now what I'm doing with soccer and I'm trying to apply a lot of these ideas of embodied, embodied experience uh, to the notion of food, but also to the notion of soccer. And, and that's why I keep falling back to this, to this, to this notion that I, the only thing I can identify as is as a materialist. Like hmm. beyond, beyond materialism, all the other tags and stuff that you can apply to yourself are just like so hard for me to identify with. But materialism, I just can't shake off. Is, is mm. I, I like I keep getting back to well, that. Well, I just want to say quickly that I love how in Latin America and continental Europe, there's still like, like, like practicing Lacanian psychoanalysts. That would be so rare to find in North America. But I remember hearing, in fact, I think I even have an, uh, like an, like an aunt in Chile. Do you think psychoanalysis works in, works in English? No, I think it, do, I think it can. I think, well, I mean, I, I like Lacanian psychoanalysis as you, if you listen to our episodes, you know that I'm a big fan of Zizek and, and Lacan in spite of my, you know, my lib tendencies. I, I love that stuff. Um, but I think, uh, I think it works. I, I, so I have actually not to like take the conversation off totally off the rails, but like my mom and my stepdad, they're both in therapists and like, and in fact, my mm -hmm. stepdad was, pra was studying when he was younger as a medical doctor to become a Freudian psycho psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. But I think what he found is just that psychoanalysis, one of the faults is that it's a little bit too, sometimes, depends on the therapist, it ends up reifying the method, the technique too much. And it's like obsessed with the technique and kind of is dehumanizes the kind of connection between the patient and, and, and the mm -hmm. therapist. So that was his problem with it. And he, he's, he's, he identifies more as like a humanist therapist. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and some of these people who he's influenced by are actually like, you know, phenomenological psychotherapists too, which is a little bit, uh, but he doesn't really believe in methods. So I think, I, I think a lot of the insights of psychoanalysis are really good in terms of like how well they work. I think, I don't know, but I, I think it, it does seem like psychoanalysis can be vulnerable to people getting too obsessed with doing the method correctly. And then not maybe paying attention. I don't know what you if you, if you think about I, that. If I, you've ever talked about that with your with your wife, I, I think that I think that well, if we incorporate the loose critiques of of psychoanalysis and and try to reconnect it back to Zizek, even if Zizek never actually read the loose, is that um, the notion is to apply like he, he did read the loose and he hated it. Uh, yeah, but he read he 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 read it in the least uh, let's say the least nicest way possible. Like contrary to what Deleuze said, do, he said there was a good philosopher and his name was Deleuze, and then Guattari came along and ruined his no, life. No, yeah, he said Guattari <laughs> should be shot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, that, that joke is amazing. No, but what what I like what I, what I like about well, what what's the relevance of talking about psychoanalysis today? And if we connect back to Zizek and and my notion of materialism. 
we talk about psychoanalysis still because psychoanalysis in a way to reverse um marx dialectics to analyze superstructures to reveal material conditions but that's my reading like beyond beyond that i think that the the policy like uh, like not not policy let's say uh, police like behavior of psychoanalysis can be detrimental and in a way it was very much instrumentalized to to create a normative desire in in current conditions so i think there's a limit to psychoanalysis but um, it's not my field of expertise i, I know i'm going to mm -hmm. get in problems with my wife because of saying this <laughs> but but regardless I, I do believe there's some value in psychoanalysis into revealing the underlying material conditions that end to sh end, end up showing up as a uh, psychological behavior. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been through years of psychoanalysis and I've only found it helpful, but then there's a point where you're like, I need to go live my life outside of this. Kind of like, so, it's kind of like shifting to offline. You yep. got to live your life well, offline outside of the, outside of the office. Well, yep. I guess just quickly to comment on your, on what you said about not identifying as a leftist, anymore. And I wonder if it's consistent with, I think, something that I've said before, which is, I think there's always a problem with isms in that, like, at least myself, I like to think more about specific human problems, people like mm -hmm. things that can make people's life concretely better. And I think that like, whenever you, you, be, you, it's easy to become a slave to an ism, right? Because then you feel like, oh, I have to connect everything back to like, is this truly leftist? Is this truly whatever? And it's like, to me, it's like, those things don't matter. It's just like, what yep. are things that make sense in the context of what we live? And I think that's actually why, which maybe we can get, get into later. I think some of my positions end up coming across as like a little bit liberal because like my reading of the way things actually are and like not caring about being some pure leftist lead me mm -hmm. to conclusions. And I guess, and I wonder if like your move to just say, well, I'm just a materialist is also in a way being like, well, we just need to pay attention to like the context of people's lives um, and like yep. what is that are actually the things affecting them. I don't know if, would you agree with that? Well, I'm, 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 to be honest with you, I think I think ideas emerge out of condition, and we don't necessarily change conditions with ideas. Like th this is this is what is very hard for me to to commit to. Like, do ideas change the world? Really? When? Like to to an extent, maybe. But are these new ideas just a fa just a just a reflection of some underlying real condition that is actually shifting? beyond our con con our control or even our ability to recognize and then these new ideas emerge to describe the fact that new material conditions are are being tangibilized in reality that's 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 what i define as materialism is is not uh, is not a radical uh, you know physicalism where i'm, I'm not a monist mm -hmm. i think sure. I'm, st I'm still within the realms of dialectics but i just think the subject is a symptom i, mm -hmm. I don't think i don't think the subject itself is um it's a, it's a pure affirmation. It's a, it's an, a spontaneous event. That's, that's why I'm so uncomfortable. And so I have always this distrust on the, that we have to rely on subjects for change because subject subjects are a symptom. We are a symptom of language. We are a symptom of material conditions. We are a symptom of relationships of power. So again, it's, it's, it's hard for me to try to justify that subjects are the cause of something. For me, mm. subjects are the effect of something. They're not the cause. So that, that's why I identify as a materialist, because I still believe the idea of subjectivity is, is mostly an, an illusion. It's, it's a, it's a self-created fantasy, this narrative fallacy, that the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. That, that's why I still, you know, even trying to make sense of this, of this notion that we, we should be talking about material conditions, where I think most, mostly lefty politics are talking about fantasies, narratives, identities, and subjectivities. And, and people don't really, don't really grasp the notion that these subjectivities, they are a result of something else, of something that came before it, of a material condition that was the cause for these subjectivities to emerge. That's, that's why it's hard for me to identify as a leftist. Like most, mm. most of the leftists today are idealists. They're modern. Like for, for God's sake, like, like still mostly the leftist politics is modern. And that's for me is a, is a disaster. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe I agree. we can I think, get to yeah. some, uh, real world examples here. Cause I, I, sure. I don't know that I've really thought about it, but leftist is the one label that I have never denied. There, there's a bunch that I would deny and that one's not one of them, but 
Uh, we in the Anglosphere and our Angloid audience are, uh, we, we look to South America like in the last mm. year, uh, I think since, uh, what is it, March or February. Uh, we see the elections in Chile. We see the election in uh, Colombia. We see uh, Lula back on the yeah. rise. So if you are a, a non, no, just a non-leftist, I guess, Victor and I, I think we, we've agreed that both of us are non-partisan leftists. Mm. But if we, if we look at this, it, it seems like good reason to be excited. Mm -hmm. And I think probably our audience is excited about it because, you know, nothing's going on up here is kind of the narrative that we have. Like we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, our lib prime minister and yeah. we, whatever is happening in, in Britain. And then we got Biden bumping into walls right below the border. So we look to, to uh, Latin America as, oh, there's like a, a wave or a push or something, something's happening somewhere at least, even if it's not mm -hmm. here. Uh, but it sounds like you're pushing back against that a little bit. So what would you say with regard to uh, what's what's being called the pink wave? Right. So th this is interesting. Like for, for me growing up in, in, in Brazil until I was 10, but then after that, Mexico, and I've been traveling pretty much all over the global south for the past almost 30 years of my life, um, is that we never really believed in, in democracy. And I think this very much relates to what Zizek normally says. It's like we... We know, but we don't want to know, so we don't know, right? So we we know that democracy is fake. We know that democracy is corrupt, but we really don't want to know because it's too hard to think about alternatives to change the world. So so we don't know. We pretend like the next guy is not going to be corrupt. So so we play along, okay? And and this is mostly my analysis that um, the way Latin America explains the world is with the structure of soap, soap operas, with novellas, right? So there's there's this structure, there's this narrative, there's always the hero, the villain, meritocracy is always part of the story. If you if you work yourself hard enough, you can pull yourself out of poverty. There's there's an opportunity waiting for you. People still believe in the lottery, like a social lottery, financial lottery, whatever. The the Bitcoin lottery. Exactly. We, we, we believe reality is structured like a novella, like structured like a soap opera. And, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting because soap operas don't go anywhere. Like you can go into Netflix in, in South America and, and some 80s soap operas are still number one trending. Oh, wow. we, we haven't been able to go past them. There's one very famous from Colombia called Betty La Fea, which is Betty the Ugly Secretary, that I think is still number one in Latin America in Netflix. Is insane. We're still trapped under that fantasy, and that's and that's how I think is our relationship to democracy as well. Even if it's, it doesn't matter what you believe; it's how you act. I think you guys said said it in a podcast as well. It doesn't it doesn't matter that you identify yourself as a Marxist or an anarchist. You have to vote. You have a passport. You you are a subject in a way. You're subject to, and you're a subject from this this notion of structured reality that is reinforced through habits and acting. Is what you do what matters, not what you think. So if you vote and you have a passport and you have to renew your license, you're, you're a liberal. It, 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 I mean, <laughs> you can think whatever you want to think, but your acts on the world just say otherwise. And, and that's why I think that even if people have this, and I, I think populism in Latin America is being, is being the scapegoat of hope. Damn. You know, it's like we are, we are unable to dream about an alternative. So we just paint capitalism under different, more amazing, more friendly colors. That's it. That's all we can do. Our our freedom today is we're free everywhere. We're free for everything. We can be naked on the street. We are challenging all criteria about uh, sexuality. We are free. We are even challenging this notion that we can live forever under this artificial intelligence that can be downloaded into an Amazon server that then your family is going to have to pay rent for you to survive. But we're free to think about whatever we want. But we cannot raise taxes. We cannot limit the mode of production. We cannot challenge the property of common goods. Those things are beyond freedom. So what I think is that politics today, especially in Latin America, but I also think this is a global disease, is that we are allowed to talk and challenge always, only those notions that don't really change the underlying material conditions that actually produce reality. I mean, true, true. So. Uh just just for the listeners, we read just a really short section of Zizek's Answers Without Questions, which comes from the Idea of Communism series. I think it's book two. 
But I just wanted to read this a little bit because it lines up with what you're saying. The recurrent story of the contemporary left is that of a leader or party elected with universal enthusiasm, promising a new world. And he puts in brackets Mandela and Lula. But then, sooner or later, usually after a couple of years, they stumble upon the key dilemma. Does one dare touch the capitalist mechanisms? Or does one decide to play the game? If one disturbs the mechanisms, one is very swiftly punished by market perturbations, economic chaos, and all the rest. And kind of what you're describing, this seems like it might be a split between uh, maybe your generation in the global south versus our generation in the global north is like mm -hmm. the suburban white kids up here are realizing this. Yeah. Our parents all believe in property. Yeah. Our parents all believe in uh, democracy. And it's only, it's only now that these cracks are starting to show for, yeah. you know, what we'd call our generation and, and mainly the younger generation, which is either to just completely check out of the system. I don't want a mm. part of it or to realize this is bad and it's only going to get worse. Yeah. I, th I think I think it's related to social mobility. Because in the 70s, even if it was still very much skewed under like democracy was skewed to fulfill the, the interests of capital, which is which is in a way my reading of, of neoliberalism, I think that social mobility disappeared. And now the conversations we're having and the agendas proposed for the economic future is you're going to own nothing and you're going to love it. That, that, that's fucked up. That's fucked up on so many different levels. We're talking about a future where everything is up for rent. Of course, in, in this type of a, this type of an inver a dystopic inversion of the idea of communism. And, and well, my, my tanky uh, guillotine owning uh, left its Marxist side kinds of like it. Because if there's less bourgeois to decapitate, it's probably going to be faster. So <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm just going to close my, my tanky parenthesis there. I'm Acceleration. Not, it's, an, it's not an incitation to violence, but we, if we only have to decapitate seven billionaires, it's going to be much easier, guys. So so let them <laughs> let, let, let us play as uh, accelerationists for a while and let's pretend like five guys own every one of the commons, but they already mm. laid the technological ground for actual communism to exist, which is great. But the issue is that right now we have a sort of dysfunctional dystopian communism where one guy owns the intellectual property of 80% of the world. Mm. And we have like Bill Clinton has bought how many acres of land in the US for agricultural production? It's it's insane. Like the guys doing the, the last two years of pandemic, the guy hoarded up on, on agricultural grounds in, in around the United States. So as soon as we say, okay, thank you for hoarding it all, all up. Now we just take you out of the equation and we and we syndicalize it or we make it into a cooperative and we own it, the ones who work it. We we we've gone we've gone into that direction. But my my concern with this is that um we are not having the discussion that we need to be having about property, which I think it should be one of our main concerns. We keep talking about you know painting democracy under different colors, making democracy less inefficient. And and of course, it will be better. Yes, it will be objectively better. But what we also have to think is that for someone in the world, it's always too late. It's always urgent. Revolution is always late for somebody. For, for a mother yesterday in Ghana with three kids, revolution is already too late. So uh, having, having this notion of having only aims but no goals, it's dangerous to me because it, it leads up to a, to, a, to, a, to a type of passivity that is... That is um, self-patronizing in the sense that oh, it's going to be better, marginally better. And in a way, we change as much as possible for things to remain the same. All right. So very based. I don't disagree. And the revolution, yeah, it, the revolution is always late for somebody. But then my question is, what do I do tomorrow? Do I get a brick and walk up the street and throw it into the window of a TD bank? Is that going to help the woman in Ghana? So when we're talking about aims and means, as we've been talking about for basically weeks here, uh, what are we doing? What are we doing here and now that matters? Or how do we even measure how it matters? So I'm putting an interesting 
position here between two people that I respect and both of whom I've heard uh, talk a lot about this. So, Victor, on, on one hand, we've heard the firebrand, property's the only issue, abolish private property, nothing's ever going to get done. And then we have have like your, your mantra, which is institutions are bad, and you agree with that, but also that institutions are important and can be reformed. So I, I was wondering what the other side of this uh, teeter-totter is going to look can like. Can we have institutions with no private property? Then me and Victor will be really good friends. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, I, I mean, I, I kind of wanted to ask, I, I kind of wanted to push you on, on something else, but maybe we can, like, this will be related, but I wanted to push you on not wanting to identify as a leftist, because I guess mm -hmm. in hearing your concerns about, and actually Pills said it earlier that uh, <clears throat> him and I both kind of identify as what we sort of say nonpartisan leftists. And I guess I just see leftism as an orientation towards like what's going to make people's lives better, uh, what's going to make people what it seems like people want. And I guess I guess I'm hearing a lot of in, in what you're describing, kind of your concern with property, your concern with alienation. Like that sounds like a normative concern, right? Like to me, that doesn't seem that different than being a leftist, right? It's like, you know, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, I guess I'm hearing like a kind of crypto universalist like 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 claim about what the good is. Uh, well, still trying to deny, or am I hearing it like kind of a denial of that? But like everything that you're hearing clearly sounds motivated by a sense of justice. And I guess, or like, might we say why, why the deny idea it? of communism? Yeah, 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 which yeah. which which is a perfect segue into the topic. So this notion that Marx was a crypto normativist or 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 crypto moralist, even worse, uh, it's 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 weird because I mean you can give a, a moral reading to some of Marx's pieces. I, I guess you can. But the notion is that why do we need to change material conditions, especially to the means of production, is for new subjectivity to emerge. Well, and why does that matter? That, Who cares if, if there's not a well, sense of justice underneath it? it. No, I, I mean, the sense, the sense of justice is in the sense that today what we're trying to fix is the symptoms of current existing subjectivities. Oh, yeah. And, and okay. the, the, the Marxist analysis is that, well, you, you can fix the symptoms as much as you want, but you're never touching the underlying conditions. The only thing that is actually going to promote something new to emerge is the change in the, in the material conditions, which is in the end property. Right. Okay. No, I, I don't disagree. I guess I just want, I, I guess I just do think that you have a sense of justice underlying your perspective. So I think that you, well, like yeah, the new, reason new these things matter. Yeah. Like, like the, the reason those things matter, the reason you're concerned with property, it sounds very clearly to me motivated by like what yep. some ideal of the justice. So I guess that, that's all I meant. So like, and and I just feel like yeah. that is being a leftist. Like I think that well, like that is. If 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 you want to if you want to I I can I can I can I can take that uh, that that nomenclature I really don't mind. But for example, one thing that would be mandatory for me to consider as, as a Marxist or as a leftist even it's the idea of collective versus individual. That for okay. me is fundamental. If you if you don't think collective is first and most more important and constituent of individuality, then then you, then you cannot be a leftist. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I I tend to think without that they're kind of to use Heideggerian language, they're kind of equi primordial. I think they both like exist at the same time. I don't think you can give one the priority over the other. I think neoliberalism has given us has made us give individuality much over more priority. But mm -hmm. I still think that it's a mistake to be like, well, the priority is to collective. I think that they're equi primordial, which maybe we don't have to get into. But uh, yeah, but, yeah, but if you want, you can I think to that. I think this. This primordial, I, th I think you guys have scratched this topic once. You got it, you got into this conversation once for like five minutes and then you drop it. And I was like, oh my God, I really wanted to hear your takes on this. Because well, here's your chance. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I want to, if you, if you can, if you guys can elaborate, I would really love to, because I think most, most people tend to oversee this. They might be historicism, like, I, I don't know if, if, if it's, it's not even philosophical. It's more like history of philosophy, but to get this notion of, are you dialectical? Is it material before idea? Do, do ideas even matter? Ideas exist before ma before matter? Or, or the, the collective constitute the subject? Or the subject is born and then his affirmation on the world changes collectivity? Like, I, th I think even if these notions are overlooked, they tend to, in a way, domino effect into your views of the world. And, and that's, why, that's why I think like most leftists today, they are idealists, they are modernists, and they are voluntarists. 
That's that's why it's so hard for me to identify as a leftist because fundamentally I don't agree with any of those three. I don't believe in personal merit. I don't I don't believe ideas fundamentally change the world, and I don't believe in, individuals can change the world. So, like even if I, I, I if I agree with social justice, like your fundamental notions of the world are 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 foreign to me. Right. Right. Yeah. So I mean, think, I think. Yeah, pills. Oh God. Well, put me on. All right. Well. I mean, you guys already know what I think. It was the whole last episode. So if you walk up to someone on the street and you ask, hey, are you an individualist or a collectivist? That's an, it's a non-question. Um, if you, if you want to go back to the, the means by which you would identify yourself as an individual in the first place, they would be collective means. You are never on your own. Your language is not your own. As you've, as you've said, your being is not something that you are just in control of and that you self-determine through life. But I also think that the context in which Diego is bringing this up is political. And in political, I think very obviously there's no such thing as individuals. Individuals are useful placeholders or personas or figures. And any talk about heroes and villains all falls into this trap as, as if individuals make history which i think that is uh demonstrably untrue okay well well i, I, well, I mean <laughs> well I, I mean i know diego's curious about like what you think about i mean i guess the question is like i guess the, the question is how like what 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 has priority like kind of at, at a maybe ontological level like like what like what is like what's the the underlying and i guess i mean i was describing that i think like these things are kind of equi primordial meaning that like I think the individual, like, and this is, I think, influenced from, you know, you mentioned, Diego, you're reading Merleau-Ponty right now. And I think to me, mm -hmm. like, Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology, I, I think they're, they're like, my reading of it is that it clearly shows that kind of the experience of the other and then the experience of, like, individuality, meaning that there's, like, an alterity between you and another person, which kind of gives us a sense of individual. Like, I think those two things are co-producing at the same time mm -hmm. like you can't have like i don't think there's a collective experience and then that creates like i think both are kind of happening at the same time um and then i guess the, the question is like what are the kind of implications of that for the question of like property and capital and i don't know if i have an answer but, for that but but that's my view but can i can i give you can i give you a radical materialist reading of what you just said sure like for example let's say so i was born in south america right the food my parents ate constitute their genetic uh, build, and it was passed on to me. So the macro engineering of using corn as the basis of alimentation for our generation has an effect on our bodies. Mm -hmm. And, and this, was, this was before us, eh? before any individuality emerged, you were constituted by the effect of corn on your parents and any potential genetic predisposition you can have on the world. Mm -hmm. Like in, in that sense, in that sense, material conditions are always before not only individuals, but any ideas that can emerge. The, the more we study about but, but gut biome and gut health, the more we understand what, what Freud wanted to do with, with bioanalysis. You know, psychoanalysis, in, 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 and even I don't remember in which of Freud's book is, is this text, but Freud said that he knew the limits of his practice. Because in a way, he could not describe the relationship with the body into an emerging psyche. And I think the more we study genetics and biomedicine and, and epi, epi medicine, the more we understand everything comes from our material uh, constitution, from our material uh, mind, if you want to say it, from the, this Merleau-Ponty idea of, of your embodied experience. But your embodied experience has a history, has a material history. Where were your parents born? What type of, of, of genetic disease did they have? What type of vaccines did they receive? What type of food they ate? Their, their, their relationship to nature. This constitutes what you can think. So look, you can see what you're saying with, with the description, but what you are offering is a description. You say, look, if we go back, we are corn. And you can go back to, to whatever. We are the food that our parents ate and their genetics. But you have to also understand that there's an observer in that equation. Yeah, and I agree that with that. That observer right now, like being you or being the person who's who's writing this analysis of the fact that 
we are not just ourselves. There's also a position there of observation that is also not strictly material. Like this is not a strictly material analysis in the way that you're framing it because there has to be someone doing the analyzing. And the analyzing is where the things that we associate with the individual come out also as important, you know, thinking. So Diego, I want to ask you if this is, if, if property is the only thing that matters, if property is the thing that we have to go back to, if everyone who is not talking about property is a fake leftist, and of course, <laughs> we're always, we are always on the look for, or we're always on the lookout for these fake leftists. Um, then why would you make a documentary about soccer instead of you right. know, property? Yeah, the, the, the left's worst enemy is the left. It's, it's, it's <laughs> <Exactly>. insane. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't go to that extent. Like, I, even if I, I don't like openly identify as a leftist, especially when I'm talking to Anglophones, and in the sense that you guys have a notion of the left that is very foreign to us, is is you, you know, especially the United States. Relating liberal point of views to the left is so hard coming from from Marx. It's super hard because you end up with this antagonism between individual freedom and individual effect on the world versus material conditions. And it's, for me, it's always super hard to reconcile. But having said that, why, why did Diego, I accept to make... The reason that I ask is because very materially, both you and I sit in front of cameras and microphones and... We film, yep. and that's most of our day. So I'm trying to get well, I'm trying to get you to answer that connection between what what are we what are we doing if property is the thing that matters? Because you know I tend to right. agree with you that property is the thing that matters. But if yeah. if we are just like in involved in this uh, constant flow of internet communications, we got to game the algorithms. We got to do all this stuff. Where's the connection between like the the yeah. soccer part of it and the property part of it? So I have I have different lines of flight, you could say, or like different lines of uh, of work that I want to accomplish with what I do. Okay, the first one of them is uh, Capital Humano. Okay, so like this these t-shirts that I send you guys, like the, the branding that I use everywhere, Capital Humano, Capital Humano. Why do I say Capital Humano? Because I want to raise awareness of these, um, that we're still proletariat, that we're still spendable, that we're just one variable in a system that has no moral uh, judgment, that uses us as one other variable in something that doesn't concern us. You know, the proliferation of capital doesn't care about humans. And the proliferation of capital doesn't care about nature. It has its own internal logic, and we are one variable within that logic. And that's completely amoral. It's outside of moral judgments, right? So that's that's capital humano. The other line of, of, of work that I do a lot is uh, it's uh, the other sentence that made me very famous. That was the one that I use on the debate is, why do you believe that which you believe? Is in Espanol es por qué crees lo que crees. Okay. So it's a question that I constantly ask everyone that I interview, everyone that I talk to, to reveal the fact that ideology still operates in the sense that there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a superstructural construction to your view of the world that helps you explain reality, even if it doesn't necessarily have any connection to reality itself. Okay. And then the third line of work that I, that I line of work, I could say, or, or line of research that I do is the demythification of meritocracy. And I know meritocracy is probably not as nefarious in, in the global north because it's partially real as it is in the global south. Meritocracy is the sense that um, the harder you work, the better is going to be the results. And this is measured by a bunch of indexes like the Gini index, which measures social mobility. And in Latin America, it has been alive for decades, but people still believe in it. And soccer is one of the fields where people still believe in meritocracy, where they believe that you have talent and you've put the hours on it, you will make it and you will be famous and you will have money and you will lift your whole family out of poverty. This is the myth of soccer. And that's why I think soccer is still a very proliferous myth that is so big and so huge, especially in the global south, because it has the structure of a soap opera. You can still think, and it, it, and it ends up behaving like, um, a monotheistic theology in the sense that you choose a country, then you choose a team, then you choose a player and you glorify and you create this 
you know, Diego Maradona and you, and you have this, I went, I went to visit the church of Diego Maradona in Argentina and there's a church, <laughs> that legal church of Maradona in Argentina. I was baptized under the church of Maradona, which is going to be a great part of the, of the documentary. But what I want to show is this notion that even under soccer, meritocracy is a lie. Even under soccer, not those with the best talent are the ones best rewarded. And even under soccer, if you don't own the field, you cannot play. They have to ask for permission to play. They need a ball. They need a space. And there's some fundamental things that are outside of the scope of the main narratives that people are not bringing up forward, right? So this, this is why I accepted the documentary and I gave it my spin in order to introduce the, the, the conversations and the talking points that I wanted. And, and, and this, is, this is drastic pills. Huh? Like the main issue and one of the main issues that we discover is where do they play soccer? Who owns right. the field? Who owns the field? And and like for example, we had we had an episode because it's going to be like um, twenty eight episodes of five minutes, and then one full hour and a half full documentary. And we had the story in the Amazon River about a floating community where they live in, live in these floating houses in the river near uh, the Amazon River, actually near the Rio Negro, which is one of the two rivers that that constitute the Amazon River. And they don't have a field when the when the river is high. Because during raining seasons, the river goes up by 23 meters and the fields disappear. So they have to rent a little floating field and we had to transport the floating field to the city so they could organize a soccer tournament. So there, there's, there's this, like, I, I, there's a sentence that I love is that if politics is water is war by other means, soccer is politics by other means. That's what I want to do with the documentary. And would you also say in that line then that like, is is media war by other means because you are a you are a media creator and like so are victor and i by by other yeah. by other media but uh, is, is know, that is that like a, a space yeah. worth fighting for is it a space worth um like can can you put it on its head just by talking about it because this is it's hard like, eh? you already referenced me <laughs> in this uh interview saying ideas don't matter and that really comes to mm -hmm. the heart of what I mean by ideas don't matter is like, if if I were to if I were to say, all right, I'm gonna shut this all down. I'm gonna shut down the media, my our like my my channel, my whatever, and I'm gonna go do something. I wouldn't know what to do, and I really yeah. don't know what to do. I don't have that. Yeah, yeah. I don't have the capacity to understand all this. Uh, like, oh, if I have a political theoretical outcome in mind, then I can realize it. I don't. I don't know what any of that is. Yeah. I, I'd, that's, I'd that's actually why... be interested to hear what Victor thinks about that too. Please, please, Victor, go ahead. Um, like what? I what are you asking me, Pills? Like in terms of if if Diego, what Diego is saying is right. Like if you are a leftist, your issue is property. Then should you be managing like what you do in a day only based around that or? Can you do a documentary on soccer and bring in the property aspect? And is that a sense of consciousness in the material historicist sense that is real? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. And I mean, that also brings me like I want to ask Diego some questions about like like property, because I know there's a couple things. So like maybe a way into that would be to ask you about something that you said earlier, Diego, you kind of made this distinction between aims and goals. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't exactly sure. Are you saying that like the aim is kind of like the, the direction we're going in and then the goal is kind of like the end point. Exactly. Right. So, so and you, and you That's say like, aim, yeah, okay. Okay. And aims make more sense to you than goals, right? Because goals are, no, be I, I think both are necessary. Fantasy? Okay. Okay. I think both are necessary. And this is exactly the point about talking about the idea of, com of communism. Because is, okay. is the goal still relevant or are we just talking about aims and Got we it. change aims Got every it. year? You know, this, this is why. And, and going, going back to Peel's to notion. So Peel's is, is hard because you say, okay, in the end, even talking about property, it's in the realm of ideas. Even talking about property, is in, even, even believing that talking about property can have an effect on people is idealism. Yeah. Right. I kind of so, think that's that, true. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 hard. It's super hard because then debates are completely worthless. Conversations are worthless because they're all symptomatic. This is all symptomatic of 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 real material conditions. So what's the point of doing it then? This is this is why I think Zizek is still relevant because his notion is that we use 
psychoanalysis to reverse back to reveal material conditions. That, that's why I think I think conversations should be around the realm of, of property, because maybe we can get some trauma. Well, what about you know, property? Like, like, so how should it change? Like, I want, I want, I'm, I'm kind of curious about like concretely, you say we need to talk about property in what way? Like, like, so for example, at the moment, one, one of the main economic concerns is the collapse of aggregate demand, right? So at, at people have less and less money to spend. We are more and more productive than ever. Our productivity keeps going up and salaries are flatlining. Right. So what happens in economic basic economics is that you have a collapse of aggregate demand. People produce a lot, but they cannot even buy what they produce. And Max Marx foresaw this. I mean, this is not new. We have been in this trend for the past since the 70s, at least. And, and more and more, we throw away what we produce artificially because people cannot afford it. And we don't we don't even believe the market can self-regulate. So it's easier just to produce more trash, hide it into the ocean or in some remote island in Africa and produce more. And just like have iPhone 14 and 15 and 16 instead of rebating the leftovers so people can actually afford uh, in a way related to their to their salaries, right? So so this this artificiality created by the market, and, and again, this is not outside of capitalism. Eh? This is this is capitalism. Like people that criticize this and say, no, this is effect of Keynesian um neo uh, neoclassic uh, economic logic on, on capital. No, 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 this is capital. And Marx foresaw this, like the rate of, of margins are going to grow thinner and thinner as, as we progress. And, and the, the future world that is proposed to us, it's a world of rents. It's a world of no property where all property is congregated in very few hands and we have to rent everything. This is the world that is proposed to us. And, and why is it scary? Because we already have climate migrants, climate refugees. We have people in soccer that don't have fields. People that don't have their own houses, and we have these hordes of homeless zombies living in main, main cities in America. And this is happening all over the world. And, and densely populated cities that are, you know, and, and that's why I connect back to my, to my own son, and I become very, very egoistic in this, in this notion. Because I know from very first hand that we're all going to be handicapped very quickly. Our ability to produce money and to even pay for the rent of the things that we don't own is going to disappear. It's a window. What is the story with your son? Ah, so, so my first son, Paulo, uh, he actually turned 10 yesterday. Happy birthday. And uh, he was born with a very, very weird genetic disease. He's one in 50 million. It, I don't even know the name in English. It's a very complicated name. But uh, he got diagnosed into autism. And then my wife uh, started researching. And, and this is this is incredible. Uh, my wife doesn't give interviews, but I swear to God, she's like the most brilliant person I've ever met in my life. She's a Lacanian psychoanalyst. But because of my son, she started researching uh, medicine. And now she's like a, like other doctors call her to talk about genetic medicine oh, wow. because of the advances she had made with our son. It's incredible, incredible. The diagnosis we had is that he was going to be unable of speech and he was going to lose partial motor functions uh, by the age of seven or eight. And now he's 10 and he has a vocabulary of around a hundred words, but he's still fully, fully functional uh, in his body functions. So just because of uh, supplementation and different type of exercises and stuff that my wife discovered, can, can you imagine the trauma of being an Akanian psychoanalyst and then having a son that is diagnosed under autism and then discovering that the problem is the body? It's the alien. Can function. you imagine that? Like it was, yeah. it was super intense. Yeah. And she, she still practices uh, psychoanalysis. She still has like 30, 40 patients in psychoanalysis, but now she always connects psychoanalysis to the body. You know, like, like there's no point talking about your depression if you don't, if you don't, if you have a lack of B1 vitamin. Like if you don't fix B1, there's no point treating your depression. And, and for me, this is, this is bioanalysis. Like this was Freud's dream for us to be able to connect the symptom that is the subject to the body, which is the source. Right. So when, w because of my son, because of his genetic disease, I started reading and I started researching because I got really paranoid as a parent. I was, so he's condemned to be homeless. You know, the, the reality for, for, uh, for, the, how, I don't know how to say it properly in, in English, but div uh, diverse functionality. How do you say it in English? Neurodivergence. Not, yeah, not neurodivergent, yeah. like the, the body, the body type. 
physical functionality because in in mm. in, in Spanish as diversidad funcional. Oh, functional different, diversity differently abled. Differently abled, exactly. So yeah, right. so the the current politically correct version of 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 disabled is differently abled, right? But it's still a capacist notion. It's still a notion that your worth is related to your ability to produce, right? So un under that notion. I, I got really scared because my son was condemned to a welfare state or to homelessness. And, and in Latin America, they're pretty much the same. And, and, and it got me really scared. And I got to research about this and, and what was the future going to look like. And under this notion, if you connect the dots between collapse of aggregate demand, hyper-industrialization and hyper-productivity, automatization and the disappearance of able its jobs and the disappearance of welfare state, what you have is a large sum of population that is not going to be able to pay rent to live. And if you don't own anything, you will have nothing, but nothing on a level that we cannot even understand today. That's, that's why I believe property is so important because in the future, the opportunities to produce money are going to be very scarce. Salaries are going to be collapsed. Cost of rent is going to be extremely high. And it's going to, I, I foresee we're going to live in a world where utopia exists for like the 1% and 99% are going to live under fucking, you know, like uh, Elysium, you know, the one, mm -hmm. District 9, yeah, yeah. one of these dystopic movies from the, from, the, from the last decade. Have you heard of this example, Diego? I, I, I don't want to say the wrong car brand, but I believe it was BMW. They put mm -hmm. seat warmers in all the seats, but you need to have an app that you pay $15 a month to, to unlock exactly. the seat warmers. Exactly. So it's just going to be a complete world of microtransactions where you don't own mm -hmm. anything, even if you yep. buy it. Anyway, the example of you bringing up your son like this really makes sense. What you said earlier on, which is this, uh, this uh, firebrand rage you have against the idealism of the left. So yeah. the idealism of the left in, in terms of, you know, we have to, I don't know, whatever fantasy it is, we have to overthrow, we have to guillotine, we have to do this. And I, I, I kind of want to like negotiate some sort of uh, truce between what I know your views are and what I know Victor's views are. Is there an institutional way to do this at all because we could like you're from mexico and we are from canada so we could talk about the united states until we're blue in the face we know the united states is it's a failed state it's fucked up yeah um yeah. but is there is there any sort of democratic alternative um i i it sounds like what you're saying is i don't you don't have much faith in this I, pink way i prefer china <laughs> okay <laughs> wait wait let me wow finish. okay you don't have much faith in this pink well, wave the... necessarily you don't have much faith in institutional reform um mm -hmm. victor despite being a lib is actually very intelligent and very articulate on the topics of institutional reform and he focuses on that and, and reads it all day so i wonder if mm -hmm. there's like some way to negotiate between these two positions as sort of a, 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 a closing down arc because you're saying we're done, Diego, and Victor's saying, yes, I agree that everything is shit, but we're not necessarily done with it all yet. Well, it's kind of interesting because in a way, like, I don't know, I've been listening to Diego like give his account and I was thinking to myself, well, I don't disagree with any of the kind of like, you know, diagnosis <laughs> of society. Um, and I was trying to figure out, okay, well, am I just more pessimistic about the possibilities or like more pessimistic about change? And like, you know, I have some other notes written down of things that I maybe want to bring up, questions about subjectivity, which maybe we won't have time to get into, which I think informs mm -hmm. my views about like what a kind of possible future is. But then that all got thrown totally uh, haywire when you said that you prefer China. And I was like, okay, well, that's over the US. Oof, any uh, day. Oh, okay, over the U.S., sure. Uh, no, I still don't What, what other that. options do we have as Latin America? The issue yeah, is that, so I, I don't know if you guys can relate to this notion, but um, there's, there's, a, there's a punchline in, in Latin America where we say we are too far from God and too close to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our doom. Why we are doomed as a, as, a, as a continent or as a region? Because we are too far from God and too close to the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, we're, we're the shitty manufacturing background. That's, yeah. that's what we are. 
We are we are the labor camps of the global north. It's true. That's, I mean, that's yeah, Latin America, yeah. and that's the global south. To be honest with you, if you yeah. take away a couple, a, a, a few very rare examples, and and I used to live in Singapore. I also have to add this. I used to work with Chinese banks and Chinese companies. I know how they do business and how they operate. And and there's a lot of propaganda about the the way China works that is that is brainwashing you guys completely 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 is insane like That's this, this demonization of china and it's, it's still it's still michael bay eh? is 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 michael bay in the same sense that top gun is glorifying the the navy and the army like this demonization of the alternatives it's still the propaganda machine like yeah it's true that china is buying africa and it's buying latin america but the rate of interest is lower than the fmi so so not yeah, too I mean, bad, eh? Wait, what is FMI? F, uh, um, uh, Fondo Monetario Internacional. Oh, IMF right. in English. Yeah. International Monetary Fund. Yeah, because the IMF is gougers with their with their interest rates. I mean, that that doesn't surprise They're, me. We yeah, are born in debt. We are born. Yeah. In, this this is this is insane. Can you imagine? Like, uh, I know the, the the talk is getting too political for pills, but like in in <laughs> in, in Mexico specifically. 25% of the taxes captured by the state are used to pay the interest of the national oh, debt. IMF, yeah, that's that's messed Can up. Can you imagine? For sure. Yeah, it's... this this notion this notion that debt is not hereditary it's a lie. We we are all we are all born in debt. Yeah, of course. I, so, but like back to this question of China and you know, I think the the concerns that I have. I mean, I I don't doubt that some of the stuff we're told is is untrue. But I, I think, you know, ultimately, um, I think my concern with with in polit from a political theory perspective is like I want some grounds for whatever sovereign government over me. I want there to be some thing that I can see that makes sense, that makes it legitimate, like like legitimacy. Right. So like you're 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 too modern for me, Victor. Like yeah, you're, I'm you're too rational I mean, for me. You, you're well, trust, I, you're just, trusting rationality. Your trusting rationality is too romantic for me, my friend. No, but like, I don't you, think it's romantic at all. You still believe you still believe we're rational beings? No, not at all. No, not 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 at all. Not at all. So, so this what, has nothing what is this to do with rationality. In, in, in institutions. No, no. So it's not it's not that. I actually think that it's like it's a very like even materialist like point. I think that like you you need the government to have something that makes them legitimate. And one of those things is like to keep you safe is like the basic is like a basic like this is kind of like a Thomas Hobbes point. This is like yeah. a very I like want to speak in Victor's but it has defense nothing. on this point in that he has very little faith in human rationality, which is why he thinks institutions are necessary. Yeah, a big other is necessary. Yes, well, no, absolutely. the big other is in actually, your mind. The big other is not outside of your mind. The institution is just what, to make it so people don't kill each other. And, so, and, so and exactly. isn't Zizek's point that the institutions are like a big other? No, the in, well, they, like they the function big, that way. They can function that way. Ideologically, they can, but you need someone who's going to punish you if you're going to go like steal your neighbor's lawn furniture. But then but again, I, guess, like, I, I go back to this notion. I really don't disagree with institutions. My problem is with property. Can we have institutions without pro private property? Then, then, then I'm then I'm into it. So maybe, I mean, it depends what we mean by private property and like, so, and, and then like, pup, what's the, what's the, what is the negation of private property? So what kind of a human relationship? It's like, mm. I guess I think we need something stable that, that, that like at least gives people a sense of, of like, uh, some sense of semblance of trust that like there's some reliability in their life. And when I say reliability, I mean that in their everyday mm. life, they trust that yeah. like, someone isn't going to arbitrarily come and just like take their stuff away or like kill them for no reason. Right. We need some stability. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there, so, so there's, like, there's sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So, 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 I, so I think, so, I th so I think like to me, like that's really all I mean by institution and like, you know, you mm -hmm. might not, it sounds like you don't even necessarily disagree with that. It's just like, it seems to me that like private property Again, like, like there's a kind of vagueness to like exactly what, what we mean by that, because you were like a lot of the kind of, um, points you were making earlier, Diego, were about, you know, uh, no one's going to be able to own anything anymore. Right. So like mm -hmm. to me, I was like thinking to myself, okay, well, so you do think that people should own things, um, but just maybe not in the conventional sense. Right. It's like people need to no, have yeah, access yeah, yeah, yeah. to goods. What, what, it, it, uh, okay. So, so two things. First, there's a, there's a line by Gote, uh, Gota, I don't know how to say it in Gota. English. Goth? Gotha. Go, okay. Gotha. There's a line Gotha. by Gotha that I absolutely love. That is that I prefer 
in, I prefer injustice to disorder. Right. And, it, and, and I think is what is what you're saying, that you prefer a certain level of democratic imperfectibility to chaos, to anarchy, to the lack of institutions, because you don't have even a framework of regulations in order for injustice to be recognized. Because if we don't have a framework of institutions, who determines, you know, moral law, good and bad, uh, crime, punishment. We, we need social institutions. And, and that's actually the first argument against any libertarian point of view. Yeah. The, the notion of private property only exists under the state because you need yeah. somebody to recognize private property. If you don't have somebody to recognize property, property doesn't exist. You know, you can say you can own anything, but if somebody doesn't recognize, someone with an authority doesn't recognize your property, then what do you mean by the legitimacy of, of property? It's a completely empty claim, right? So in that sense, I agree with you. I prefer a certain level of injustice than disorder. I agree. That's why I said, uh, and, and my notion to move in this direction of property and what I mean about property, Marx, Marx has a differentiation between two types of properties. There's private property and individual property. So you can own things. Of course, you can own things. But the question I raised today is about the property of commons, is about the property of territory, of land, of natural goods, of technology, of in, in, in some that are super new, like intellectual property, like data. You know, like why why are those privatized under? I mean, they are owned, but they are owned by very few people under very questionable means. That's that's my challenge. So, so it's not it's not about you know the, the, again. I think we're talking about the same the same thing in different time moments. Like I agree with you in the aims, but we're probably disagreeing in the goals, or or we haven't discussed if we have the same goals because probably the aim, like the mid steps, we agree. Like I'd say, what I'm talking about is that we discuss about property. Why? Because today, like very few of us is gonna own their own houses. And probably all our parents had their own houses. Like we don't, we don't even dream about it anymore. We're just like, we, we normalize the fact that we're going to rent until we die. Okay. And, and there was a certain degree of, and you see, this, this is why I, I cannot escape Marx. And I would love to, and I swear I'm not dogmatic. I would love to get out of these arguments, but it's, but it's hard to escape because in, I remember my parents, like once my parents, he told me once, okay, I paid for my house. Now, what do I want to do? I, I will never be able to ask myself that question. I will always be scared of being homeless. Like, can you imagine the logic of productivity, like destroying your subjectivity because you're always scared of homelessness? You don't think that has any effect on our subjects? It's, it's, it's insane. Of course you do. Like once you pay your house, once you have a place to fall dead and fall ill, you think about different things. Like, what are all these different things that we're not thinking about because we scare about homelessness every day? This, this is my question about property. This is my challenge to property. There are some certain basic things that you need to, to live that capitalism is taking away from you little by little and transforming everything into a centralized ownership that rents everything out to, per, to people that have less and less acquisitive power every day and to jobs that are disappearing. Like this, this is the materialist criticism of capitalism is that you, you're going to own nothing and you're going to have no option. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, like for sure. I think maybe where there's like a slight disagreement, as you said, is like the goal. And, you know, I think my, like, I don't exactly know what the goal is. Like, I don't have like a, a, a fully fleshed out thing, but I guess I have concerns about, um, like, so I think in our, when we first started recording that the, the, the version we don't have, I, I think I kind of mentioned to you, cause you asked me, do I think that, uh, you know, that capitalism is necessary? And I think I said that like, it, it's, no, if you it, believe it, in the free market. It, yeah. Like, or, and I think my answer was like, well, it feels really hard to imagine like some overarching structure telling you that like you can't exchange yep. these things for goods. And I think like, so I, so I think to me, like that kind of private interaction of people being like, well, if you give me this, then I give you that. I mean, this is like a very human thing that, that all human societies have done. It's just become this yeah, markets perverse. are not capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. Exactly. Okay. So, so good. I'm, I think we agree on that distinction, distinction then. So like, so like, we it's a very strange question. Do you believe in the free market? Cause there is a market. Well, of course it exists, but that's a separate. Is there is free? a market. Of course no, we the, believe in the, its existence. The free, the free part of it. The yeah, free the part free. of it is the question we should be asking. Oh, yeah. No, so, exactly. so no, no, all markets are not. But I, but I think there's also a question that I have about subjectivity, because I think, 
you've said you said a couple times something along the lines of like the kind of subjectivity that's created by capital that's created by our private property paradigm and i uh-huh. wonder this is kind of a philosophical question but i wonder like where do you think that it sounds like when you're talking that you see subjectivity as being caused by these structures um and I tend to think that, well, these structures are also kind of a reflection of subjectivity also. So it's like... You see? So you're so, you're an idealist. You believe ideas come before matter. Uh, no, no, no. So I think, so I think the matter, actually, so I think like the, 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 the markets and these structures that we have are a reflection of like the material conditions, the material body of like how we are. So like, you know, and I, I think like that's like, um, for example, like Lacanian psychoanalysis, right? Like the dialectic of desire, this like this... This like um like it's impossible to quiet this dialectic of a desire that like you're you're always going after the object and it's like I think but in a way capitalism fits that now I don't, I don't like it I don't like the form that it's taken but in some ways but I don't think we learn to desire we learn what we desire but the structure itself like the fact that we're going to fall into this pattern of like desire satisfaction desire satisfaction you, I think that you mean is fundamental that is lack. A, I mean, it's a fundamental, yeah. It's it's fundamental. So I think like in some ways that structure in subjectivity, in my opinion spontaneously creates these structures that that maybe so, lead to these outcomes. So that makes me a little I, bit more I pessimistic. Can I maybe interject a little bit? Because I have I have completely shifted on this in about the last six months or so. Thinking this is how this is who we are. And you kind of learn this in like our our, our high school class. People are greedy. People are going to seek their own interest. Um, but I I really wonder which comes first whether it's the social conditions that tell you, you you can be successful, it doesn't matter who you fuck over, it doesn't matter which community you start from, if you really wanna make it to the top, you can screw over everybody and you can make it there. And I wanna mm-hmm. know, I really, this is not a question that I've solved at all, but I don't know what kind of people we have outside of this system. And for example, like, David Graeber, the new the, or the new book. Um, yeah, he, I, I have it. Uh, he really tried to unearth this. I don't really like agree with the analysis, but I really buy the project of like what yeah. we what we are as people, as like a, an organism that has been alive for one hundred and eighty thousand years or whatever it is. We don't really know what we are if we're born into this, raised in this, and die in this. And that's the only future we see. That's the only past we see. There is something else that I believe is possible. And unfortunately, Victor, I'm not going to be able to say, here's what we could try out. Here's what we could do. I I don't want to be mis... I I also don't want to be misunderstood. So I'm not saying that like, you know, capitalism or this kind of like perverse kind of like systems that, that like lead to this perpetual like, like, accumulation of more and more and more. I'm not saying that that's destiny, but what I'm saying is like, I think because of the way we are, we are vulnerable to those kinds of structures emerging. Yeah, and I think that true. potentiality is always there. We're talking, right? we're so, talking about human nature. Yeah. So, so it's not destiny, but it's like, we are always, well, well I guess, but so we're always going to be vulnerable to being captured by so, these things. So that you stimulate. believe in the free market, you believe in the free market, you believe in human nature and you believe in the institutions. But but I believe that's in Lacanian not- psychoanalysis and and, and Merleau Pontian phenomenology. I mean that's where I root my my accounts of of the human yeah. being. Yeah, it's not like, like some of kind all, of, naive. of all the critiques I give of liberalism, Victor never falls into them because he never believes in the best of people. He believes in the worst. No, people, I don't. Which is the the well, thing. Well, it's not. But that it's not even the worst. It's like it's it's like no, but it's not even best of worst. It's self interest. No, 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 I don't. But I don't Marx believe in self interest. I don't. I don't think people Marx have believes that the basis of yeah. politics is self interest. That's actually one of the reasons why I don't like some Marxism is because I don't believe in self interest. I don't believe people know what their self interest is. Like like I don't. Oh yeah, don't people don't know exists. what they want. People yeah. people are taught what they should want. That's the issue. It's like it's like an, we are aliens arriving in a country that is playing soccer, and we believe the objective of life is to score a goal. Like, yeah, this sure. is my reading of, of criticism of capitalism. That's actually, that's like we, nice. I like that. No, mm-hmm. like, like we, we arrive at this moment in history, we are trying to make sense and create categories to describe what we are observing and experiencing. And we, we create our, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be like, forgive my explanation because this is definitely not my strongest field, but my notion of, of the birth of subjectivity is, um, the master slave dialectic. Hmm. So within the master-slave dialectic, there emerges a sense of self. 
in the in the the notion of the recognition of the other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, what what Marx did to inverse the master slave dialectic is to say that the slave that is not recognizes uh, that doesn't get recognition from the master looks for for work and nature to create a sense of self. So our sense of self comes from our relationship to to the world how we build our life and how we relate to the world. And this, I think, is validated by Merleau-Ponty and, and a lot of other thinkers. And correct me if I'm wrong, who was the thinker that brought this notion of master slave dialectic into France and had a huge effect Sartre? on, on a no, lot of... Kojève. Maybe Jean-Paul Sartre. No. Kojève, oh, yeah, Kojève. Kojève, that's right. Okay. That's right. So, okay. So my, no so my notion of subjectivity, I, I still, I'm still in the Mar Marxist reading of the master slave dialectic from Hegel. So we, we, we lose in some, in some level, in some degree, we lose the battle of recognition. We want to be recognized as a, a self, uh, uh, autoconsciencia, self, uh, aware consciences, but yeah, we lose this. And then we, then we, we, then we go to nature to discover who we are. But within capitalism, alienation happens because we are never able to identify who we are because we never get recognition from our work. We are alienated. And out of alienation, it's the birth of pretty much everything that is with identity politics. It's everybody trying to discover an identity, to be somebody in the world, to be recognized as yeah. something, someone, as a preference, as a sexuality, as whatever. But we can never be fully, be fully satisfied by this because there's no material fact in the world that give us that sense of self-confidence. So that's that's why I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for this sense of, of, of materiality and property. Because like the type of questions that my father asked himself, like, okay, I've paid for my house, I have food on the table, now what should I do? This opens up new possibilities. And what I'm afraid of is that we are, we are being uh, cut off from these new possibilities of imagination because our desires are trapped under the machine of capitalism. And not only capitalism, but liberalism as well. I, I, for me, it's harder and harder to separate them. That's, 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 my, that's my, my philosophical argument for why I believe discussing property is the only way we can open up for new subjectivities. And this is not crypto moralism. I don't think it's going to be fundamentally better. The, the, this is fair. where I stand my ground. I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be more just. I'm not saying it's going to be better. I'm just saying it's going to be different. And, okay. and, and in this and in, in here, very delusion. I much rather go for the creation of new subjectivities than to, to stay trapped in this nostalgic nightmare that we cannot get out from the past five decades. That, so that's agree, my point. I agree, I agree. I agree with 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 almost all of that. I think I think maybe I'm more. I'm I'm trying to locate like where I stand on like maybe this question of subjectivity and like the, and new possibilities. And I think in, to some extent we share very similar pessimism. But on another sense, I think I might be more pessimistic in the sense that like, maybe you, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm hearing you, you know, th these kinds of new subjectivities and also like alienation. Like I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to it, like unalienation. Like I think we're always alienated. There's no way to not be alienated. I think there are mm -hmm. like concrete specific examples of things that clearly like owning your own labor power, like, like having more control over like, um, your, the, the your material conditions. To me, and I, I do, I'm not scared to kind of moralize it. Like that just seems good. That seems better to me. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. but then, but this idea that like, you know, new subjectivities will emerge that will be less alienated. Like I, I don't even know what that means. I, like I, I think, I think that like we are by nature that the thing, this is where I'm kind of a Lacanian. Like I think, I think that like, uh, alienation is like a condition of possibility for our subjectivity, like for our, the desire, the way that we are alienated by the symbolic. Like this is just a, a, a feature. Uh, and, and it's not something we can ever get out of. We can, we can find, I think we can locate concrete things that will give us more autonomy and more control, but I don't see that as like a different subjectivity. Yeah, you mean, you I just mean see that, that as like, if, if I can, if the symbolic, if I can, oh, sorry, if I can give just an example of, of something that seems to have survived the, uh, the capitalist spore reproduction is the family. Like in your in your family, you have people that you don't like. You have people that you do like. They remain your family. You have the weird uncle. You mm -hmm. have the the grandparent that says stuff you disagree with. And these are these are. I think it might be our only like little cloister, which is even being dissolved today. But it's a the yeah. only little cloister of relations that are completely outside of a market. And you know, if you want to think of 
new possibilities are not really new possibilities. They're really old possibilities. But to to think of of humanity as a fraternity, which might honestly, which might honestly not be possible in today's world with the size of states that we have, with the yep. lack of, you know, intentional community that we have. Maybe not. But like you have an example with your family of of a community that is not based on on market relations. It's based on social relations. Yep. Absolutely. Like for example, like I take care of my kid not because I get something in return. Well, you could say, you know, there's there's a there's this beautiful sentence from um a quadriplegic that is a philosopher of capacity in, in Spain called Javier de Romagnac. And, and this is actually something you guys could benefit from. Like there's a lot of philosophy in Spanish that is not translated, that is beautiful, like Gustavo Bueno, Javier de Romagnac, Ernesto Castro, well, Borges, of course, but there are some other thinkers that could be great. But this guy has a sentence that I love that is that um, aquellos que se dejan cuidar dotan de sentido a sus cuidadores, which would translate to those who allowed others to take care of them give meaning to caretakers right so like this this is what i think you mean pills when is is not necessarily a transition but is is subjectivity as a result of of social relations right you know like social relations yeah. of care this is kind of what i got from the from the graber book even if his historiography is a little bit off but he the point of him writing the book and his co-author, I forget the name, but the, mm -hmm. the the point of the book was like, this is not the only way it could be. This is not even the the way it's always been. Exactly, exactly. I think I think that that history, that rewriting history, is to erase our cognitive bias to individualism and self worth, right. and to give a more collective tint to history but i will be I, and i agree with you with the criticism to the book I, I would like a systematic reading of history a systemic reading of history like a reading of history based on the philosophy of systems not because i think this is still very modern in the sense that is is romantic it, it, it has this notion of individual free will and reason and I, I think i think we need to overcome modernity urgently in so many fields all right. Well, while we're wrapping up here, Same I'm just here. saying I'm I'm feeling a little bit more sentimental than I was when we started the conversation, and it's and it's still left with the same question that this, what is this? The Zizek reading is uh, answers without questions. Like the question, really, we're we're still left with, you know, wherever we live is what do we do? It's not good. Wait, wait. So we can't but, just but I, talk about can it. Can I just? No, I'm not. No, dude, I'm not. I'm not wrapping up. We don't, okay. okay, wait. The question we're left with, I guess, is just, what do we do? And mm -hmm. I'll leave it with you, Victor. Okay, well, I, like, yeah, so the Graber book, I have been, I actually have the audio book. I haven't, I, I was listening to it, like, when I was uh, out cycling for, but I haven't, I need to return to it. Um, and I thought it was, you know, it's interesting, but I guess... Yeah, I just I find myself to be such a skeptic of like these ideas. Oh, we can change our subjectivity so that we treat people who aren't our family like I fa our family. Like I just I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's 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 a that's a bastardization of what you guys are saying. But I just I think I just am fundamentally very much a pessimist about that, about those kinds of things. Like I think family is a unique a unique thing. And maybe in the context of like a much smaller tribal society, right, like that Graeber is talking about at these smaller places, but like in, a, in, a, in an advanced society. Uh, that just doesn't seem like a plausible answer. But just me. as a counterexample, like what if we made online communities that were localized, like our Discord, for example? Do you think people treat each other with different respect in there than they would in like a a larger market? Just, just yeah, compare the conversations in 4chan to the conversations in Twitter. Of course, and 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 I think we want to have a society where there's like people can people can. Um, you know, you know, create social bonds in these various like, in fact, there's a lot of work uh, in this in democratic theory, it's called like associational democracy, where they talk about, you know, like building uh, kind of like institutions that allow for these like much smaller groups of, of associative ties um, that could that can create like better conditions of solidarity and like and, and like respect for others. And yeah, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily um, necessarily against against those things. But but I guess I just 
I'm just less, I'm less optimistic about like, what is going to be something radically new? That's another thing. It's like, is there something like new? I think that I just think human beings are the same. Like, I just think that like, you, we, you like, believe in human nature. Uh, well, no. So I believe in, I believe that there is a structure and that limits human nature, but I don't believe in one set human nature. So I think that like Merleau-Pontian phenomenology, Lacanian psychoanalysis show us the limits, the traces around which this variety yeah, of human nature can operate, but it's not determined. Like it's not like one thing, it's many things, but it's limited by, and actually I take Zizek's in some ways, uh, philosophy to be talking about that. Like, like, which is why I think he, I, I, th I take him to be sort of pessimistic, like in the reading we had today where he's like, you know, like what, like, what do you want? These things are just falling into this kind of fantasy where you're like, oh, I'm going to overthrow this. And just like, he always loves talking about V for Vendetta, right? It's like, what's going to happen after V for Vendetta, right? It's like yeah. the same. What do you guys so, want? Yeah, exactly. What do you guys want? So, so, and I think that we, we rarely know what we want. I mean, human beings are, 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 are sick, confused creatures that have no idea what the fuck they're doing. And they, they get, they get pulled and influenced by different, different structures. Like I, so I agree with a lot of the analysis, but in terms of like something radically new, like, I just think there's, there's a structure, there's, there's kind of a thing that, that you can work with this kind of like outline of what a human being subjectivity can be. And I think that there are ways that we can make those things like better. Um, so, and in that sense, I'm like a moralist, but new, radically different. I'm just, I'm just kind of a skeptic. I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try to to answer both questions. So, so Pils asks, what do we do? Or sorry, like, like, what do we want, right? And and from Victor, you get this skepticism of 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 what could be and this challenge of really new subjectivities. Can we go there? Do they actually exist? Do we want that? Okay. So, so to both, I, I don't really care about subjectivities. Again, I think the subject is a symptom. That then that's why I think, what do we want? I want property. Like, wh why do I want property? At least to have the safety that there's an end to my work. At least I want that peace of mind to say that I don't need to work until I die. Like, that, that I can choose to, to dedicate my life to a different endeavor that is not mandated upon me on the basis of and survival. And it sounds like you don't just want property for yourself. You want property for every single person, regardless of ability. You exactly, exactly. That's exactly my reading. Now, of course, I'm I'm the Chaval de Troyes. I'm the the like the, the horse of Troy, in the sense that if I if I am white, blue eyes, one eighty four, a hundred kilos, blue eyes? like I'm I'm yeah. I have blue eyes. It, and, and if I have right all there. the yeah, if I have all the privileges of a cisgender whatever, and I'm worried about property, like what what I want to show is that. Um, Everybody's susceptible to this danger. Any, anyone can be susceptible to this peril of, of losing all property on things. And that's why I want to talk about property. Uh, my romantic philosophical logic to explain it is that it will leave and open up to new possibilities and new subjectivities, which is all very nice. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but in, in is, is a more like, the aim versus the goal, like the goal is the new subjectivity. The end, the, the, the aim, the short-term tactical objective is survival, is, is a much rather simple sense of, I don't want to be exhausted by my work until death. I want to be able to indulge myself in boredom and say, what the fuck do I do now? Because I'm not, I'm not thinking about food tomorrow or, you know, existential threats to my life or to the dignity of my son. Like, wh what, what is that like? What, what is my what is my mind capable of if I can go to bed without worrying about the dignity of my son's life because he's disabled? What is that like? That's that's what I wonder. That's what I want. That that's what excites me. That's what I think we we should aim and strive for. Because and and I think property is what's going to open up these possibilities. Because today working till death. It's, it's the only thing that is not negotiable. It's, it's the thing that everybody has has made peace with this in the back of their minds. And we just like, we squander and we debate and we talk about different things and we find different interests. But in the back of our minds, we're like, oh my God, I have to make money out of whatever I do. Otherwise, you I'm going to be homeless. I, I think we agree on the aims for sure. I, like, you know, I, like, I think that's kind of maybe what I end up focusing on more in, in my own thinking is just like, what are some concrete aims that can help us put ourselves in a better position for people. And like, you know, I think you, you were mentioning, I, I, I was reminded of uh, Thomas Piketty, you know, the, do you know this, this economist, uh, yeah, yeah. this kind of left-wing kind of Marxist economist. I think he, yo, he has yo, really yo. interesting proposals. Good example. In his most... Good example. No, no, he's not I, a Marxist. I don't think he's Marxist. 
I don't think he's, he's not Marxist, he's but he's definitely he's definitely very very left wing though, very very left. No, but he's Canadian like, at most. I do I most at most. You Canadian. think so? I mean, I don't I don't think know, his, his, ana- his no. analysis of capital is pretty like um, is, is 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 pretty. Well, Marxist he's inspired. he's still adheres. He's still on the subjective value of 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 uh, prices. Is he? Yeah, okay. He's not into the labor value theory. He's subjective value of theory. So that itself okay. excludes him. From a Marxist economist. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair, fair enough. So he's not a Marxist econ- economist, but um, but he's I mean, left, as you could say. That, that's why. That's why it's complicated to have a conversation with the Anglo left because the Anglo left is mainly liberal, and 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 more and more in academic circles, uh, liberal and Marxist are like diametric opposites. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, so, but in terms of aims, I think that he 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 has presented some some good concrete aims. He he talks about like the in- wealth inheritance, right, where where every person would be born. Uh, and he does the math on it that you would you would inherit automatically from the state like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, like when you mm-hmm. reach age eighteen, right? And like he has a whole bunch of interesting arguments about like how that would enable people to. Uh, and he has really good arguments too about like how inequality is actually sometimes productive, but like t- way too much inequality is not productive. Um, yeah. Like obviously that's still within a capitalist paradigm, all that stuff. But anyway, I think it's an aim that. Yeah. Would, my argument is always this, like, so, so yeah, while I am skeptical about whatever we want to call these new subjectivities, I still think that like people who are concerned with this need to be fighting and arguing for things that can put the working class, the people who are vulnerable right now in a better position so that then they can keep asking for more, right? Which is like, Absolutely. so every little step on the way that get, puts us in a stronger position when I say us broadly in the sense of people who care about this. Um, we should be supporting and so and then goals i guess maybe i just don't know what the goal is i'm kind of a skeptic i guess well it's it's very i think even marx said it is the end of private property also co- communism is is only that eh? like beyond beyond that claim i don't think communism is anything else but the end of private property that's it hmm. the the rest of the analysis in capital and in the critical project of gotha and even in the, <laughs> even in the uh, the articles the, we read for this series so far like bad you he never says private property he just says that the collective and, and, and this is and this, this is, is much more clear this the, and this is this is uh, and this is one of the critiques people make about Badiou, that Badiou is not really a marxist in the traditional sense because if you don't critique private property are, what are you talking about like what what's the point like uh, what are you aiming well, for i don't think right? we're going to accept and, and this that for... critique because that's not what he was trying to do which is the same thing i argued with well, Matt yeah, about I, when I, Matt it's probably... unfair it's unfair i'm i'm I'm, I'm, I'm mischaracterizing Badu a lot, but but it's true that he's being criticized under that notion that he's not really a Marxist or Marxist enough if he doesn't include a critique on, on property. Like, at least he should mention it. Well, he, he has a lot. And he's a, he's a Maoist. Property? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That that's the other thing that is sometimes hard to swallow from Badu. Like, I think I think it's 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 also hard to just wash the failed attempts at leftism in in the 20th century without being truly a harsh critic of the all the mistakes and but also you cannot fully just dismiss them as as authoritarian regimes and just not say well where were they when they started where did they end it like the different possibilities and what what i wanted to lead with this conversation is you, you know this notion from hegel that um what is real is rational and what is rational is real. And then Engels did the, the, the rewriting as uh, what is real is rational and what is rational can be real. Like, and, and, and this, is, this is my reading about the notion of, of communism in the sense that as much as it is rational, it can be real even if it's not. Like, for example, the, the aims we are aiming for is that as much as we can struggle for new ownership, for property, then we can create the conditions for for change to occur. And this sounds very messianic, and I, I always struggle with this part because it, it requires a certain level of dogmatism that I don't necessarily have, because it, it's it, it it in a way it, re- it requires a belief in in prosperity and what and whatever. But I do believe in it's it's more existential than that. It's more uh it's more urgent than that in the sense of survival. And that's that's why I st- I'm still trapped under this. Under, under this notion of the world. I say, fuck even the messianism of it. Like, I think all of us work this kind of job and all of us also are maybe not you, Diego, anymore, but at least you have. You know what it feels like to work for someone else and you know what it feels like yeah. to work for yourself. And there's a completely different sense 
of the world that arises from that. When you have the freedom, because I have to go back and forth. Um, I know Victor has to go back and forth. And if we could just do like the ownership of labor, that Oof. creates a huge difference in, um, you know, the quality of life. But also, if it fails, there's nothing. There's nothing waiting for us under there. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the what the good world would be. But I think at least out of this discussion, I understand that that like property is what makes life worth living. Unfortunately, but it is the kind yeah. of thing that we have to deal with. And, and not and not only property in the sense of ownership, but property in the sense of subsistence, yeah, security. Like you're gonna, not going to die, and yeah, your kids aren't going to die. Simple as that. And you know the next exactly. generations that I can die. Absolutely. I, I just want to have this this peace of mind of okay, I'm not condemning my kids to to starvation, like that. <laughs> that sounds like a lot, but you know, like. No, totally. I mean, it seems like a, something that we we all want. And, you know, I was thinking too, being a graduate student for so long, what a difference it would make uh, to like not worry, to be able to pursue the things that I want to pursue, which is why I do like the, the kind of concrete uh, aims, as you put it, of people of like, you know, I know we didn't get into universal basic income, which there's, pro uh, but like even what, you know, uh, Piketty was proposing, right? Like if yeah. I inherited, UBI. you know, 200 grand, uh, you know, like well, how but, different but, my life but would let's be. Go, let's go. Let's go into detail into that, Victor. Okay, so UBI and inheritance of 2050 when you were born. If property is accumulated into one hand, don't you think inflation is going to devour that in like a few, not only a few decades, a generation, if you want? That's that's a problem with universal basic income that it doesn't account for inflation or where does that money comes from? Because you depend on taxation to to raise UBI. Like the 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 challenge to UBI is UBS. No, universal basic shareholding, which is a proposal that that because money in a way it represents value, but it, what we want is property. So what we should aim for is not universal basic income as you have a uh, least common denominator of your subsistence, but universal basic shareholding in the sense that we can collectively own these things, and then the the, the profit that comes out get evenly distributed. Like, are you guys familiar with the with the structure of a PNL? Profit and losses spreadsheet. You mean no. shareholders for a company, or like even like basically when you, like for example, let's say okay, so oh, sure. I, I want to create the price of this, right? So yeah, the yeah, PNL, yeah. like the pro the profit and losses, is how much labor costs, how much raw material costs, how much sure. uh, process, liquid, what are the distribution, marketing. It accounts for everything, right? So the PNL accounts for every profit and every loss within the product. But then on top of that, we always add an extra percentage for the shareholders. Surplus. 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 So surplus value. value but <laughs> like we could go into this, but talking about it again, this is my this is always my original question is what does talking about it get us? Well, yeah, I think yeah. it's interesting. I, I mean, so well, but, it re it I, reveals just, it only reveals the material conditions. Yeah, exactly. it doesn't change I mean, them. I, it just reveals just them. And just to be fair to Piketty, I know that that his argument about like in terms of inflation, like I don't know it that well. But I know a lot of the math on, on his proposal will have to do with like taxing inheritance taxes. So like a lot of rich families, like they, they inherit this huge amounts of wealth and then they just pass it down to their family without taxes. And it's like he he claims that he did the math and it's like a lot like doing putting more of an inheritance tax could pay for a lot of that. So like it wouldn't lead to like more inflation. It would just redistribute. Um, but yeah. sure, I mean, so there's problems the, with with UBI and, and other things that have to. No, yeah, absolutely, and I think as an aim, as an intermediary aim, it can bring a, it can bring a lot of good to a lot of people that are really struggling right now. Exactly. Brazil yeah. under Bolsonaro fell back 30 years on nutrition. Like yeah. we have as many malnourished people today as we had 40 years ago. That's crazy. Brazil yeah. again got into the problem of malnutrition because of a right wing president. This is this is is completely urgent. It's today. It's actual. It's it's result of bad policy and of course COVID, if you want, and recession and whatnot. But it but it, it it didn't happen in every country in Latin America. It happened mainly in Brazil. So of course it has to do with what Brazil did, right? So so in that sense, I think of course UBI will immediately help a lot of people. We will solve the problem, or just like 
like delocate it or just like move it somewhere else because it, it's it's always strange when 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 people talk about this uh black legend you know the 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 black legend of communism no the 100 million deaths and this ridiculous made up numbers by the CIA and stuff so like when when you get into the numbers for example for malnutrition the the statistic at the moment is that 8 million people die of hunger every year 8 million okay and we're talking about we having the possibility and the capacity to produce food for 10 billion people so we we can produce for 10 billion okay and 8 million die per year and then the four leading causes of death are uh, heart disease diabetes cancer and alzheimer all of them are food related so so what's the point of having a system that uses the market as a regulatory logic that overproduces and kills the people that consume too much and kills people that consume too little because the profit because it's only about profit it doesn't care about people it, it, it we're not even part of the equation and and we're talking as if we we were this is this is what is monstrous to me in, in the sense that putting ourselves within the the objectives of the market it's it's the it's the most narcissistic argumentation ever like it, it doesn't care it like we're, we're not even like we're we're not even part of the like we're one more variable that's it that at most we're one more variable and and i'm afraid of liberalism because we tend to design institutions around the logic of capital with the bias that the market cares about us that's my problem with liberalism but diego isn't making a podcast yeah. about it and all talking together it's the same narcissism it's not we're not it gonna is? do anything <laughs> It is, but my other option was to work for PepsiCo. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, so, but, I never just, was presented uh, quickly, with a choice. Yeah. Can I can yeah, I say just, can I say this is yeah. less worst or or not even yeah. less worst? It's less worse, Yes, it's less worse. I, 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 I don't know. Say, yeah, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Like for example, I, I look at what I used to do, and I and I'm ashamed. Yeah. Like I I used to run PLs. I use I use. Can you imagine? I used to change the packaging sizes of products to alter size impression and skew subjective value. You mean like putting air in a bag of chips? Yeah, and changing the proportions of the rectangle so people think the, the value of what I was buying was more than it what actually was. Right. So just, Well, Diego, just, I, can, I can safely say what you're doing now is much better. So thank you. Yes. And I hope, yes. and I hope that after the documentary, I learn about something new, and that I can eventually do something more about it. And this notion that uh, I no longer defend uh, wokeism and progressism, and I want to move into real discussions about how we can change the relationships of property. I, I hope it can be better. But otherwise, what what else do we do? Eh? What else we dream about? Accelerationism? No, thanks. Yeah, yeah, fair. I will just say on liberalism very quickly. I think that that <laughs> word. It's you have to. I think that like. It, Often uh, people who are sympathetic to like Marxism, I think they end up conflating it with neoliberalism. And I think that mm. like all I mean by liberalism is just like um, a framework that protects people from the arbitrary power of the state. And I think mm. that like liberalism does a good job with protecting people from arbitrary state power, a very bad job of protecting people from arbitrary corporate power. And I think that that's mm -hmm. like a flaw in liberalism that, that like, that I agree with you that I'm sympathetic to, but I still think that like that overall framework, um, is important, which is why I still, you know, flirt with, with identifying myself as that because, because I do care about arbitrary power. Victor, did you hear what I said late, some, sometime recently? It was like all of the rhetoric was to protect from state power, but it was also to protect them from the poor. Oh, sure. It's a bourgeoisie ideology. Yeah, uh, to some extent. It, it, uh, and I, I don't want I don't want to be unfair to liberalism because I also I also understand and I know there's several different types of liberalism. It's, it's, it's completely unfair to caricaturize it as one school of thought because it's it's a very diverse. I've I've read some of it, but not all of it. I'm sure, and I and I know I'm 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 painting a caricature picture of liberalism right now just to oppose it, and it and it's unfair. And you're right to to make no. the remark. But 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 having said that, I I agree we can use liberalism against itself until a certain degree. But we do we do need some goals in common beyond the tactical aims, you know, totally. like beyond the beyond the tactical little steps like 
little victories here and there. Uh, awesome. Lula won in Brazil. We have Boric in Chile. You know, we have uh, Petro in Colombia. Like beyond those tactical victories, we have to go beyond and say, okay, good. So now Lula is still negotiating who owns the Amazon, but now he's negotiating with uh, with with some benefits to the Brazilian people. And it's like, dude, really? Okay. Another another very simple example. The city I'm in right now is called Monterrey in Mexico. Actually, Matt used to teach here, I th if I'm not wrong. In tech he taught at, at the, the uh, Mexico City campus. The Mexico City campus. I was Mexico City. It was not Tech it was de Monterrey. Tech to Monterrey. It was Tech to Monterrey, but they was have in Mexico. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I went to the same university, but here in Monterrey, where the is the is the hometown of that university. And at the moment, here in the city, we have water cuts every day. So I only have water in my house from four in the morning till eleven a.m. Wow. Then I don't have water in my house what? the rest of the day. Yeah. Uh, right That's now, crazy. Um, it has been like that all summer, and it's probably going to be like that until September when we get water again with the rains. Okay. And I'm talking about the third biggest city in Mexico. We have other 6 million people living here and it's a very wealthy city. Actually, the, the, the little, uh, the, one of the little spaces in the city is one of the wealthiest uh, neighborhoods in all of Latin America. So it's not a shitty backyard type of, no, it is a super well-developed cities with Lamborghinis and Ferraris on the street. And we have water from 4 a.m. till 11 a.m. in the morning, every morning. But at the same time, it's in this city where we have Heineken and Coca-Cola. And they consume millions of liters of water, and they're constantly asking us for take faster showers. Wow! Like again, like like uh, this, this is my this is my concern with neoliberalism is that is the instrumentalization of the state to permit the proliferation of capital interests, and and yeah, this is the limit of and this and this is in the end the limit of current existing democracies. Current existing democracies, they only operate as a byproduct or as a subsystem of the capitalist system. That's it. Because campaigns cost money and money asks for something in return. So somebody has to fund the politicians and the politicians, they get into power and they already own everything that they have. All the power that they have, they own. And, and, uh, and of course, as the state cannot fund campaigns and campaigns are more and more expensive, whoever funds the, the candidate owns the candidate once he's in power. So of course when you get when you get these problems of water shortages that is again a result of post industrialization and whatever you want who's like we we romanticize and we create these fantasies and narratives to explain it and we end up with the logic of no no you have to take faster showers but then again 1 liter of coca-cola requires 200 liters of water and 1 kilogram of meat requires almost 10,000 liters of water. And it's like yeah. and again we're producing food to feed 10 billion people and we starve 8 million per year and the four leading causes of there are food related. This is why is like economy is worse than astrology. It's it it's the worst. It's like <laughs> who the hell like like oh my god it's insane. I I feel like I'm trapped in this insanity. It sounds like you might be able to call that hmm like a contradiction maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, maybe if somebody was only brave enough to come up with these criticisms, ah. who, who will be the guy? I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. An analysis of contradictions. Where, 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 where are yeah. they? Yeah. And that's where why we should make that? podcasts. We should, we should make people aware of these contradictions. At least I don't want to wake up to somebody to tell me you have to work harder. Like, at, at least I don't want to hear that. Like, I, I would love to get somebody to explain to my son that he has to work harder in order not to starve. I would love to see that. I will pay any motivational speaker to come to my house and give a lecture to my son that, that doesn't speak and he cannot understand because of genetic condition and explain to him how he has to pull himself up by his bootstraps. I will pay any amount of money to see that. No, I'll record not. it. I will make the most viral video ever. He should have been on crypto. I'm curious. In, 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 well, I don't, I mean, I, I need to wrap up soon, but... um. In Mexico, do they not have like social assistance? I'm just curious. Like, is it is it like? Because I know, like in Canada, I feel like there's like pretty robust like like what I think mm -hmm. they call it legally like disability. But like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what what's what it's like. Does that not exist in in, in Mexico? No. Yeah. Yeah. It does. But can you imagine? Like, even no, right now, I'm 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 fighting a couple of like I'm, I'm I already passed a couple of of intentions of law. None of them's got approved so far. 
Uh, but I, I got one to protect victims of coercive cults, like people that fall into these uh, pyramid schemes and and oh, yeah. uh, theological cults and everything. I, I I try to pass a law to protect them and to penalize people that organize pyramid schemes. But then again, capitalism is a pyramid scheme, so it, it's kind of a were hard you battle. successful in uh, in pass in getting those laws passed or no? No, it got it got to the floor. It got discussing to the floor. It got a lot of traction, but then. It, it went nowhere. And now I'm trying to pass a law and, and change a legislation to change the name from disability to differently able. Right. And it's just a matter of simple dignity. You know, it's like we still call them disabled, which is insulting. It's like it, I, like when is your son It's like it, it burns. I cannot I cannot explain it. It's just like it's infuriating. You know? So this is one of the battles that I want to 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 pass. Mm. But then again, it's to raise awareness on a, on a bigger problem that we're all going to be disabled very quickly. Pills, what do you think? I think we recorded a podcast. Yeah, I, ju I just mean... It's not should... unfair to say that it probably completely changed the world. Um, and, and no, to be serious, at least we got a little bit outside of the Anglo box for about two hours. Two hours, holy shit. Um, I want to <laughs> thank Diego so much for coming here. If you've been... Uh, I don't know. Like, what do you say? Am, am I inspired by you, Diego? No, I'm kind of like. Nah, don't no, say that. I'm inspired I'm by you I'm guys. I'm impressed by everything that you just said. So it's not. It's not like I'm don't. being breathed in by the Holy Spirit here. It's more like, oh God, now what? But uh, anyway, to our listeners, if you want to uh, catch up with Diego, last week he released a YouTube channel in English. Uh, do you know what the name is, Diego? Diego Rosarin English. <laughs> so Diego okay, nice. Rosarin simple. English. <laughs> yeah, simple as that. We couldn't, we couldn't come up with any other like catchy catchy things. Like what would you say? Like Brazilian Marxist, pessimist, uh, non-leftist, <laughs> fatalist. <laughs> anyway, uh, Diego, I yeah, gotta thank like, you so much. You, We've been you know, going for what like almost three hours now. So it was such a pleasure to talk to you mm -hmm. uh, in person instead on, of on Instagram DMs. And uh, yeah, yeah. Victor also like uh, defending your view of liberalism to you know the trash talkers. It's the easiest thing to trash talk, and you always dig your feet in, and you always got your feet in the right place. It's it's so enjoyable. It was really uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you, Diego. And I hope we can have an opportunity Same. to do something like this again because uh, it was a lot of fun. It's, I feel like there's a lot more to talk about, but we're just running out. Yeah, of time, we'll so. come on your English channel yeah please do and actually you remember i think i told you about this a while ago pills that uh, i'm organizing a live event in mexico in september and i'm bringing i'm bringing a couple of friends from uh spain germany and argentina to have a discussion about um iberophonia like the um the ibero world like what do we do? as spanish as, as as spanish speakers what do we do where do we go from here where do where do we think from? Like, what does it what does it imply to think in Spanish? Uh, is is there some level of of um, autonomy that we can aspire to? What do we do politically? Like, wh where do we rally? Like, what aims, what goals, what type of objectives can we create and construct together that makes sense for us as a region? Because because again, like I feel like Latin America was for the last almost hundred years the backyard of the U.S. And now that the U.S. and and the uh, uh, neoliberal hegemony is like showing cracks in the armor, and we are like truly opening up to alternatives, like we we can discuss if if China is a better or worse alternative, but at least it's an alternative. We we you we do we didn't have those. Like we used to live in countries that were constant targets for coup d'etats from the U.S., and we still had to go back and make business with them because we have no choice. Now we have choices. At least now we can say, okay, you keep doing this and we are going to keep building this hate towards you. And this is going to be detrimental to our commercial um, possibilities. And it's going to be more expensive to you to build up your reputation in my region. At least now we have possibilities. So possibilities are, are, are better in the sense that they're, they're not stagnated in time. They're not trapped. They, they break us away from this sense of empty nostalgia that is addictive, that we are just like falling again and again into the same same problems and same questions. And I think it's an interesting moment for Latin America. We're having like this Latin American spring, you can say, 
And at the moment, we are looking at Latin America with different eyes. So my, my invitation is for people to, 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 to take a look at the region with, with a different set of eyes, with a different set of possibilities. And, and I, I prefer change than repetition. Yeah. I mean, I got to say, we're, we're looking at Good you time, because huh? what the hell are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And I, and I just cool. subscribed to your English YouTube channel and I see that you had a, an interview with DJ Tiesto, which is kind of interesting. I have no idea what the content is, but yeah, uh, I used to, I used well, to love my, going my, to raves back in the day. So I've, I saw him live a couple of times, but it's been a while. My content is the most rainbow thing ever. Like I will do, like I, I loved, I love music. So I do a lot of song analysis. Like what I do is that I read the lyrics of songs and I, I do like the, psychoanalytical and philosophical analysis of, of lyrics of, of some of some songs. But I have done like from super like these deep songs from niche cult groups. And I have analysis of songs from reggaeton and popular culture. I'm, I'm really not an elitist here. I, I really believe all music has some static value. Mm -hmm. So I try to do analysis from different songs. And that's how I got an interview with Tiesto in Las Vegas. But I also do, for example, analysis of animes, of movies, of books. Um, I do live review of news. So I just open news report every morning and I live react to what's happening in the news, which is super fun because it's kind of this topic and it's like a Baudrillard sense of uh, this is where the world is actually happening in CNN. So it's quite fun. So you will see in my channel a lot of mix of everything. And I just wanted to say sure. thank you guys for the for the invitation. It was super nice. I, I reinstate the fact that I'm a super fan of the, of the pill pod. It's one of my favorite things to listen to when I'm in the gym or while I'm driving. It's a pity that the, the other two guys could not be here. I, I extend the invitation that we can repeat the talk and have mm -hmm. another conversation on my channel. It will be a great, great pleasure. All right, for excellent. Sure. I got to say thank you so much for uh, dealing with my technical incapacity. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Sure. See ya. And to the listeners, uh, thank you so much for listening. This has been great. I hope it was great for you also. And uh, you'll hear from us when you do. And cut. Cut.